let me uh, first of all begin by uh, thanking Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Davies for her her uh, services, her ministrations for innumerable students and faculty member who go over to Rome. Uh, our efforts would be much more difficult uh, without her expert care in this matter for many years now. I also wish to thank her in particular for uh, instituting these series of lectures. They're very interesting to do and I think that they help students shape some expectations uh, for uh, for their trip. Uh, as well as Mrs. Davies, let me thank uh, Jennifer Masici, who is her assistant in the Rome office. And uh, Jennifer uh, was a great assistance to me in putting together the slideshow and finding a much more, uh, much finer uh, presentations of these things than ever I could have done myself. So with those words of thanks, let me uh, turn to this topic which is the conspiracy of art and architecture in the formation of preachers at San Marco convent. As Mrs. Davies uh, uh, indicated, I'm interested in rooms. I'm interested in rooms that speak to us. Uh, and in the case of um, uh, San Marco, it's many, many rooms. It's actually uh, what, what was called a convent. Now we use a convent for a place for religious women, but it wasn't always that. It was usually it had a kind of, of a place for, for religious folk, mostly men. There's Franciscan convents, there's Dominican convents, but this is a, a Dominican convent. And uh, this, uh, this building that we're going to see in a moment is, uh, in my fairly limited experience, uh, but of the rooms or buildings that I know, it's one of the perfect buildings <laughs> in the sense that it is a marvelous unity. I call it a conspiracy, uh, but not in the uh, negative connotation of something uh, folks hiding in the dark doing something uh, misdeedful, but uh, uh, common spirits coming together in a, in a common project. So in a more original sense, it's a conspiracy of, of art and architecture. And it's in the form of, for, it's in the uh, in the interest of the formation of preachers, preachers, and I mean by, by particular, there's Dominicans. They are the order, uh, or the order of preachers. They are a congregation, actually an order, established by Saint Dominic very early in the 13th century, uh, with a very, very, very distinctive mission of um, of, of, of teaching and putting into into the into the world uh, of preachers, and uh, San Marco is a is a is a, a a place where these preachers were were educated and trained. So um, with that, oh by the way, when I say conspiracy, because it will go very quickly. Well, let me just get to some pictures. Uh, uh, first of all, this is Florence, uh, an old map of it. Uh, there's the, uh, the great landmark of, of, of Florence is the Duomo, which is right there. And it's actually very hard for me to know exactly from this map, but if I, I think I'm figuring it right, San Marco is back in this area. Uh, but, uh, so uh, and this was a map of, uh, of about, what does it say, 1472, a little bit after the time I'm going to be talking about. But you see, uh, Florence is still, still a walled city. So it is a, a Renaissance town, and we're going to go to a very particular place there. We're going to go to San Marco. San Marco is, first of all, it names a church. We're not interested in that now, but it names a convent, a two-story convent. Uh, and we'll right now go inside that building. Oh, before we do that, I should say, this conspiracy was something made possible by four very interesting, uh, four of uh, very interesting people. And I'll just introduce you to, first of all, the patron. The patron is Cosimo the Elder. He's also called Il Vecchio, the Old One, uh, or the Elder, or and he's also called Pater Patriae, the Father of his Country, because of his uh, tremendous work as a politician. And, and as a philanthropist uh, to Renaissance Rome. Uh, uh, 
he lived, uh, I've got these dates, I'll give them to you in orders, but I've written them up there. Uh, he, he was born in 1389 and he died in 1464. And he's the patron of this project that we're going to see. Uh, he made a, a tremendously wealthy man, the first of the prodigiously wealthy Florentines, and he made it in banking, and he was very influential in, uh, in the banking of the finances of the papal states. Uh, the second uh, interesting character here, and I'm sorry, I only have his, his uh, death mask, is, uh, is prior St. Antoninus. And he was born in the same year as Cosimo, 1389, and he died in 1459. He uh, was a very prominent member of the reform movement of the Dominican order. The reform movement of the Dominican order, like any organization, it has a, an inspired founding. And in the case of Dominic, he did, have, he did not have a very special rule. He chose the rule of St. Augustine, but it need to be fine-tuned uh, with respect to the purposes of the Dominicans. And those are codified in what are called the constitutions. Uh, I sat down on Sunday, and it took me about 40 minutes or 50 minutes to read through the constitutions of, of the 1390 version of the, of the constitutions of the Dominican order. And it, it's a very practical rule. When you get up, what you do when you get up, uh, who does what, who's elected for this and that. Uh, it's very, very ruly and very particular. Well, uh, what the reformed order uh, uh, um, that got started at the end of the 13th century, uh, uh, they had two purposes. One, they wanted to return. This is important for us to see. That, that, and he was an instrumental in this movement. They wanted to return the Dominicans as an order, first of all, uh, to their mission. Their mission was to be preachers. Uh, and uh, they were to, they were to uh, seek for pastoral fruit in the service through preaching. And an extremely important part of that preaching is that the, the, the men in preparation for that be very skilled in the habits of meditation and in the arts of study. Um, uh, uh, and also, they were to live in a convent. And that convent, except when they were on their preaching uh, uh, missions, and that convent was to lead a very, very regular life uh, centered around the Mass and most particularly the Liturgy of the Hours, as stipulated by the Constitution. So they were part of this uh, uh, monastic, I shouldn't say monastic, conventual liturgical renewal within the Dominican order, and uh, all of that was ordered toward preaching. And uh, Antoninus was the founder of this convent. So we have the patron of the convent. We have the founder of the convent. And uh, this is an, an, a somewhat questionable artist uh, rendering of what Michelangelo, uh, not Michelangelo, Michelozzo looked like. Michelozzo was Cosimo the Elder's favorite architect. He was a splendid architect. And uh, he was commissioned by Cosimo to uh, build uh, this, uh, this convent, which he did. And uh, as part of the building, he conspired with a, a first-rate artist uh, who has come to be known as Fra Angelico. Fra Angelico, as you can see down at the bottom and over there in my numbers, was born in the year 1395 uh, to 1455. Just think, though, just look at those numbers. You had people living, eating, working together uh, for by about five or six years while this work, San Marco, was in the building. Uh, Cosimo didn't live there, but he certainly came on a regular basis. And, and look at that. These guys' lives overlapped perfectly in Florence, almost perfectly in Florence. Uh, it must have been a marvelous time to be there, and that's only a handful of these geniuses at work. Um, uh, uh, just for your contemporary, uh, Fra Angelico is of interest to us because in the year in 1982, John Pope John Paul II, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, beatified Fra Angelico. He was always considered saintly by some, but he was beatified in 1982. And four years later, uh, John Paul II had very much interest in 
uh, uh, turning artists' minds not to the past but to the concerns of religion. And he picked uh, Fra Angelico, chose Fra Angelico to be the patron of Catholic artists. Uh, when you're in uh, Rome, you will, most of you will at some point stop by Santa Maria Sopra Minerva and his mortal remains uh, there in a very beautiful uh, memorial to him. So these are the characters who built that place. We're going to get to the place, but let's just look at the purpose. All these four characters with their interest in, what should we call it, philanthropy, uh, religion, reform the Dominican religion, uh, architecture and artistry are focused around this idea which I've taken from a, a first-rate scholar on Fra Angelico. Let me just read it to, with you. Everything connected with the lives of friars in the community, including their art, is oriented at once toward two goals. It's nice to have it simple. The first is the obligation to preach. And this obligation unites the group. So, mission. Fidelity to the Constitution and the founding. Second is the goal of guaranteeing the individual within the group the maximum freedom possible to seek his own path. The first goal is found in the themes of Fra Angelico's frescoes. It says chapter room, refectory, and so on. That's on the first floor. The second goal, uh, bringing the individuals, the Johns, the Peters, the Thomases, uh, taking on the, the, the personal formation of the spirit of the Dominican order, that takes place by and large or, uh, on the second floor. And so we want to look at that. Uh, as we walk into, as we walk into this place, you saw the outside of it, right? Uh, it's a really busy, noisy uh, square out in Florence, and you will walk in a door which is just behind this pillar, and you'll walk down this aisle. And as soon as you start walking down this aisle, there's a marvelous painting that I'll come to of the crucifixion and Dominic there. But we'll come to that. If you were to go through this door you would go into the church, the choir, where they would pray the Liturgy of Hours and celebrate Mass. If you proceed along here, you'll go up into a little room called the chapter room. I'll say more about the chapter later. Uh, that picture that I talked to you about in just a moment, as you walk into the cloister, as you walk into the cloister, there's this painting. It's quite tall. It's, um, it's, it's almost nine feet tall. It's very tall for a fresco of a, a, a monastic fresco of those days. Uh, it's about 3.5 meters by 1.5 meters, which is quite tall. Uh, if you look at it, I don't know what you want to say. Uh, you almost have to be there. My phone, but I, he looks like he's passionate, right? But if you also look at the gestures and the face, that face is a very serene face. He's not there with Jesus. There's the crucifixion, which is a figure, an image. He's meditating on that figure. Right? And he's using a well-practiced pose. I shouldn't say a pose, a gesture that speaks to something that should be taking place interiorly. And so when a, when a monk comes in from the outside, the first thing he sees, other than the garden, and that's a garden, right? You're from the outside into the garden, supposed to be somewhat reminiscent of the Garden of Paradise, or at least the return to the Garden of Paradise. The first thing he sees is his founder, Dominic, meditating, uh, disciplining, you might say, or training his reasons, passions, upon this mystery. All right. Uh, we're still on the ground, whoa. We're still on the ground floor, but before we leave the ground floor, and I, I wish you could be there. I wish we could be there. Um, Michelozzo built these things, and just look at those beautiful arches, and look at these beautiful vaults in here, uh, these uh, pillars. Uh, as you walk through there, you have uh, images, I shouldn't say images, what, what comes across at least to somebody like myself, and you can find it even in the literature, is 
these vaults and those arches suggest, I don't know, measure, proportion, but they also support a lot. So you get this notion of power, but you get this notion of power somehow measured. Uh, if you translate that to that earlier uh, paint, uh, fresco of, um, of Dominic, you get a, a, a very affecting scene, the crucifixion of your, of your ward. But you have a man meditating on that. So he's not denying passion, he's taking passion, and he's suffusing that passion with reason, so that he, not, uh, he enters into it without losing, you might say, his person. He's disciplining his passions. Well, that sort of discipline that we'll see in all of uh, Fra Angelico's paintings is uh, comparably there, it seems to me, in what one scholar calls the uh, austere simplicity of this grand, I shouldn't even call it grand, this uh, austere simplicity of this beautifully designed cloister. Uh, let me get all my buttons in order here. Uh, you have a handout. Uh, unfortunately, your handout and mine are, are just a little bit different, but you just got to turn it and you'll see. The handout you have has a ground floor, and that's your complicated picture here. Right? Just knock off the top left uh, 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 cloister, knock off the, well, we don't want to knock off the church, do we? Uh, just turn this thing sideways, and you'll have it. You see, when you come in from the outside, you come in this doorway. Out there is noise. You come in this doorway, yeah, and you see two things. You see a garden, beautifully proportioned, with these wonderful pillars and their beautiful arches. And if you were to look right down here, you'll see that uh, fresco of Christ and Dominic. But let's just travel along here, because this will be important to us later. This set of rooms is the hospice room. This is where they would, uh, they would put up uh, pilgrims or guests. This room here is the refectory, the formal dining room for the monastic community or the conventional community. And this room here is the chapter room. The chapter room is a very important room in the life of a of a convent, whether it's be a Benedictine a monastery or a Franciscan or a, a Dominican convent, that's where you did business, community business. If there was an election that was going on for uh, for for posts uh, in the in the community, you did it in the chapter room. Every morning uh, after matins, the community would, would gather there. They would get instructions. They may have some readings from scripture. They may have some readings from the Constitution. And the uh, professed members would, would be required to publicly confess, not their inner sins that you confess to God in the, in the privacy of a confession, but you confessed your violations of the Constitution. You were laughing out loud in the library. That may not be a sin, but it's a violation of the Constitution. All right? um, uh, <clears throat> you, um, you, uh, you, you gave some of your food uh, because you weren't hungry to your neighbor. That's a violation of the Constitution. All right? uh, so the community life was... Uh, was uh, uh, was enjoined there, and they ordered themselves in the in the so-called chapter room. Uh, let's see here. In the chapter room, what do we see? But we have uh, right in front of them as they come in, in the back wall, you have this marvelous depiction of the crucifixion. And in this depiction of the crucifixion, now remember, this is the room where the members of the community keep themselves true to the aspirations, the uh, understanding of who we belong to. Uh, at, at most institutions that go across generations have a problem of how you maintain a sense of identity. 
Well, uh, they have to maintain a sense of identity, and the chapter room is one of the places where it's important to have that in front of you. So what do you see? Well, you see the mystery of the crucifixion. Around here, you have the major prophets. I ask you to figure out what's the relationship of prophets to the mission of a, of a Dominican, the order of preachers. You can figure it out. Down here, you have... Uh, and I won't go through the names of them, but uh, all the major Dominicans in their 100 and by this time 50 year or 130 year history that were distinguished in the service of the church or in the service of uh, building up the community of Dom Dominicans. And you see they're all sort of wound together in a kind of tree or vine. And what are they supporting? Up here you see there's St. Mark, patron. There is Cosmos and Damien, Cosmos' uh, patrons. There is St. Lawrence, also a, a patron of the uh, Cosmo de Medici family. There's St. John the Baptist, the last of the prophets, the Marys. And this is what's interesting. Here you have Augustine, excuse me, Dominic, Augustine, Jerome, Ambrose, Francis of Assisi, Benedict, Bernard. These are two rather obscure characters. Uh, Romaldo and Giovanni Gualberto. Let's leave them off for a minute. And then over here, you have Peter the Martyr, their most famous martyr in the early days, and St. Thomas Aquinas. What a Leave Thomas Aquinas and uh, Peter Martyr out of that. What did they, all these things have? What did all these characters have in common? These are all founders of orders or congregations that came about in particular times of the church, according to the historical understanding in those days, uh, that uh, introduced reforms into the church. So you have uh, um, uh, you have the uh, uh, prophets. You have the reformers, you have uh, the, uh, the patrons, and then you have the central mission of, uh, of uh, uh, the certain, uh, central mystery of uh, Christianity. All right, <clears throat> uh, a quotation that uh, says a bit more simply and eloquently what I said earlier. The crucifixion seen in the chapter room with its profusion of reformer saints on the right and the patrimony of distinctive Dominicans, the OP's long gray line at the base, overarched by the prophets, expresses the Dominican community of San Marcos historical ideals and the members of those community every day are looking at this and they know that they're supported by this and they're belonging to that extended community. All right? Um, I showed you as we walked around and looked at the map, there were these different rooms. As you go into the, uh, to the choir and to the church, there's a lunette of, of, a, <laughs> of a, uh, uh, a St. Peter Martyr holding a book. Silence is golden in the church, right? Uh, Peter always has a bloody head because he got his skull cracked, and he's got a usually he got a knife in his back or his side because he was stabbed to death as well as bludgeoned to death <clears throat> on a preaching mission. Uh, as you go into the refectory, you have a refectory member is where you eat. You have your meals. And uh, the lunette above that is the resurrected Christ. Interesting, isn't it? The bread of life. As you go into the refectory, uh, where you are uh, refreshed and restored in body through food and drink, well, uh, there is a renewal of life with the resurrection. Uh, you can't can't miss the meaning of it, the sacred meaning of ordinary activities as you go through from one place to the other throughout the day. 
And in the, in the hospice room, above the hospice room, the entry to that, you have two Dominicans who are receiving Christ. He's got his pilgrim's gown on and his pilgrim's staff. So you got Christ the pilgrim, or the pilgrim in whom every Dominican was expected to see the image or the, the face of Christ. So again, it just is, uh, it enriches your understanding of what you're about, uh, and what you're about has a place for the work of these activities. Now, uh, we're going to go upstairs now. Uh, before we go upstairs, let's, let's get a little sense of what we're looking for. Uh, again, I'm quoting from Hood's wonderful book. In Dominic's vision, the ideal preacher is what we might call the elegant contemplative. And that is almost a perfect statement uh, of what was aspired to on the kind of the, in terms of a human virtue or a human quality here. Eloquent contemplatives. They were supposed to speak well, but they were supposed to speak out of a contemplative depth. Uh, for Dominic and the early fathers of the order, effective preaching was the fruit of a transformed life. And it wasn't enough to just go to college and get, get your education, get your degree. There had to have been a kind of transformation of life that took place. Uh, and that transformation of life had two large moments in it. One was through the refined, uh, refined by the gregarious hazards of the community. There's a lot that goes on in a community over, a, over a, a, a season, over a year, over a decade. So the comings and the goings of community life and the contingencies there. Uh, that's part of it. The other part is by the solitude of prayerful study. As the primary method of preparing to preach, study became the central domestic activity of the Dominican community. In a Dominican convent, therefore, the dormitory, can you believe that? I wonder if your dormitories are like this. The dormitory was as important in the lives of the preachers as the refectory or the chapter room or the choir of the church. So we're going to move up to the dormitories now and see how they could possibly serve that function. And again, it's through this, in part, the conspiracy of art and architecture. Uh, as we come up the stairway into the uh, dormitory, we come up this, through this doorway. And as soon as we come up this doorway, even before we're at the last steps, as we're walking up these steps, and oh my goodness, you come around a corner, and this marvelous, marvelous fresco uh, uh, is looking at you. Uh, and it actually has some advice for you. You're supposed to remember something that talks to you. Not only does the figure talk to you, but it's got words on it that talk to you. But anyway, if we were to, to proceed down here, you see you've got um, uh, conventional cells, for cells for the friars along the way on either side. At the very end, there were two special cells. Cosimo used to like to come there. He would spend a weekend. Sometimes he might even spend uh, more than a weekend. He would just live there as a kind of uh, personal retreat in his own dumb waiter so he could have his food served. He wasn't allowed to join or didn't feel comfortable joining the conventional life of the refectory. So he had his own food waiter to bring things up. We'll go into his room in a little bit. But uh, halfway down this hallway, there's a library. You can see where the light is. That light is shining into the entranceway of the, of the library. And this is on uh, what is, uh, uh, well, never mind. Uh, whoa, back. I told you that as you come up the stairwell, you see this beautiful uh, fresco. Uh, you don't have to have too much catechism to know what it's the story of, do you? What is that? What's the mystery there? It's the Annunciation. Sure it is. Uh, and um, in this Annunciation, there are, are, are two lines. I won't try to pick it out from there. But as you're coming up there, you have uh, some writing there and you have some script there. What the uh, top one says is, Hail, Mother, a noble dwelling of the Most Holy Trinity. So, uh, Hail Mary, uh, full of grace. Yeah, yeah, but it's not full of grace. It's uh, the most noble dwelling place 
of the of the Most Holy Trinity. And down below it, there's some advice to you. It says to the monk that when you are entering, you are fi you find yourself in front of the intact Virgin. Take care not to forget to say, Ave. I don't know whether this is a fact, but I'll bet it was customary as you walked up there, you would venerate that Safka, that uh, that uh, that figure for a moment, and uh, either at the beginning or the end, guess what words you might say? Ave. Ave. Right? So there is the Annunciation. And I leave it to you to figure out why the Annunciation might be such an important image as you're entering into the dormitory. Now you're thinking of a dormitory as a place to sleep, shower. Don't think that way. Right? They did sleep there, but there's much more going on in that dormitory. Let's look at the dormitory for a minute, how it's structured. You've got a, you've got a, a diagram of that. As you come up the stairwell here, you, um, uh, you can come in the door, and there's where the, um, there's where the Annunciation greets you. If you walk down here, you can go into the library. If you walk down here, you can go into Cosimo's rooms. All along here are rooms for the professionals, I guess we could say. Either the prior had a room there, or Frangelco actually had this room for a long time. Uh, Antoninus, I think, had this room for a long time. Uh, and so the, and, and some of your master uh, craftsmen, uh, your, 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 your lay people who had special privileges in there or special duties, they would live along here. Along here, uh, in this hallway, you had the room for the clerics. These were the people who had taken their profession, but their training wasn't completely over. Or if their training was completely over and there just weren't rooms here and you needed some, they would have rooms along here. And then this room, these rooms were rooms for the novices. A novice would have been a young man. I've heard that, I uh, read two things. Uh, one said they were anywhere from 15 to 20 years old, but then I read the Constitutions and it says no one can be accepted as a novice uh, until he's at least 18 years old. So I think they probably followed the Constitution. And so you have these rooms along here for the novices. And the novices would take their training back in this room. Eventually the training rooms were given up when a very distinguished and important uh, Dominican member of the, the Reformed Order, uh, a very controversial character, Savonarola, lived in, uh, in Florence there. Uh, he was actually the prior of the household for a bit. He even became mayor, if I'm, my memory serves me right, of Florence. Uh, but it's most famous as the room of Savonarola. But it wasn't intended to be that. It was intended to be a study room. And because we're going to see it in a moment, down here is the room for the novice master. So notice the novice master lives with access to the novices. And he lives here with the fellows who are not quite finished with their training, but he's not their master anymore. OK, let's go into some of these rooms, see what's going on there. Ah, let's go into the library first. Again, Michelozzo's marvelous sense of proportions. And uh, that library, if you go in there on a, on a day when there's good light, and they uh, have the windows open, uh, you want to study there. You want to read there. Uh, and they had, by all accounts, largely due, I'm sure, to the Medici uh, patronage, they had a splendid library. And um, uh, yeah, library. There's another view of it. In some ways, it's a better view of, 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 the, of the proportions. A comment on the proportions. You do not feel overwhelmed there. It's not magnificent sculpture. But you do feel uplifted. You feel strength, but you feel, uh, you, you, you feel a sense of power and strength, but you feel that it's somehow uh, a, a measured and appropriate strength. Um, this is Cosimo's room. Just below there was his dumbwaiter. That's where his food would be served. And uh, look how nice this is. In his room, 
We have the virgin and Jesus. And who's this guy? You know the story. It's one of three. I don't know which of the three. There's one, two, three. Who are these guys? Three kings bearing gifts. But their gifts are puny compared to the grandness of the Lord. And so these potentates, with all their wealth and power, are prostate before the Lord Jesus. Uh, not a bad message for Cosimo to see on a regular basis. Hmm. I'm not going to comment on these too much because there's a pattern here I want you to see. Uh, this, dum, 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 dum. Uh, this is cell number 40. It's, uh, it's in the vicinity of Cosimo's room if you want to plot it on your, uh, on your, uh, on your diagram. It's cell number 40. What I would observe is there's, uh, there's two things going on. Let me tell you that one thing is this. The other thing is that. Can anyone see what we would today call a uh, uh, an anachronism in that picture? What's the anachronism in that picture? I've already hinted at it. Something's out of time and place. Let's say he belongs there, right? And and. Uh, I think that's a he, and and she and she belong there, and they belong there. This guy doesn't belong there. In what sense? You kind of never read scripture. Go to church on Friday and listen to the account of the crucifixion, and write me an email as quick as you can if they mention Saint Dominic being there. He wasn't there. So poor, poor uh, Angelico got all confused, right? No, no, no. Not at all. I'll say more about that. Oh. At the end of the... Uh, this, this building was built in... Um, from, uh, these buildings were built and painted uh, from about... Oh... Uh, from about, I think it was 1438 to 1444, so the middle of the 15th century. Uh, about the end of the 13th century, around the 1280s, there was a document that circulated. Seems to have come out of Bologna through D Dominican sources, and it was called the Nine Ways of Prayer. Uh, they're very simple. I. Uh, probably should give you, you, you've got one of them. I gave you on your handout. Besides, you've got a bibliography. You have uh, one of the ways of prayer. Right? Don't you? Didn't I give you one of those? Yeah. Well, there's a wonderful document that circulated, and there was a, there was a premier form of it that, was, that had, um, had illustrations. Uh, so there were the nine ways of prayer, and here's the first way of prayer. It describes it, but then it gives a picture. This is where, where Dominic was constantly bending over, bowing, bowing before again and again over hours before the uh, Eucharist or the altar. And the second way of prayer was the way of prostration. I've just given you the picture. And then there's a description of this. This description was supposed to be an account of eyewitnesses who had actually seen Okay, poor Dominic had somebody spying on him. Actually, he's a very noisy prayer by all accounts. He was always sighing and moaning. And, you know, he probably had some of this uh, talk that charismatic sometimes had. He's a very, very no noisy prayer. As a matter of fact, it was so disturbing that in the Constitutions, it's forbidden to make noises when you're doing these prayers. But, but uh, what, what, what it was is Dominic apparently had a, a, a routine of gestures, and somebody systematized that and called them the nine ways of prayer. Described it, each prayer has its own mood or intent, and it has a series of gestures. 
sometimes you see people have the gesture has to be just right. Not like this, just like, no. Uh, there was a lot of uh, flexibility given to how you might, uh, how you might uh, perform those gestures. But anyway, there are nine modes of prayer. And you will see those nine modes of prayer. Uh, you already saw one earlier. Now you see two of them. See the anachronism? You have some Dominicans there. Of <laughs> all things, this guy's reading a book. Well, if I got my numbers right, that was the eighth or the ninth mode of prayer. The ninth mode of prayer. Dominic would take a book with him. And he would go before an image of Christ, crucified always, or before the Eucharist. Uh, and he would, he would read a book. And then he would even be seen or heard talking to the book. Not to the book, talking to the author of the book. So the book was a way of entering into that mystery. So that is Thomas Aquinas there. And that's Dominic, a very different mode of prayer. I think that is, uh, I'm not real good at uh, identifying these modes of prayer, but I think if my notes are correct, um, that is the sixth mode of prayer, this one. And, and what Dominic is doing is imploring the Lord. He's, he's beseeching the Lord. Probably, according to the, the text that I just showed you, probably beseeching the Lord for some graces for the, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the preachers. And then you have Aquinas in the eighth mode of prayer, which is the mode called recollection. Um, and I've gotten uh, that little document that circulated. And by the way, you know that, uh, that this was a very important document in the teaching of the, uh, of the preachers in, in, um, in San Marco because one of the major ways that this document spread was through a copy of, uh, it was copied into a major work of, uh, of, 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 of St. Antoninus. When he was prior there, he had some writing that was widely distributed, and at the end of that writing, he copied this. So he was very well aware of it. He wanted all Dominicans formed in it, so you can be sure that, that they were formed in it at his convent. Uh, the seventh mode, I, I just take a, a brief description. The seventh mode was when he was praying standing upright towards heaven, as straight as an arrow shot from a bow, with raised hands, joined extended strongly over its head, and it is believed that his grace was then increased, and he was carried away and implored for God for the gifts and graces for his order. So there you have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, another account, and I, you'll just have to forgive me. I say C cell 15, but I'm the only one that sees it. I forgot to put it on my list of slides. So you'll just have to take my word for it. There's more than one of those modes in those many, many cells. Let's see. There are nine modes of prayer. This is a very simple form of it. Reverence, humility, penitence, compassion, meditation, employing divine aid, ecstasy, recollection, enthusiasm for preaching. So there's flagellation. There's standing arms outstretched. There is uh, holding your arms up like this. There's holding your hands like this. There's different gestures, and each one of those gestures belongs to a particular um, mode of prayer, as they called it in those days. So let's just look here. Uh, this is, uh, and you can check them off on your sheet if you wish, this is cell 18. Probably this is the first mode of prayer which indicates veneration and reverence. This is cell number 21, and it's the fifth mode of prayer. Am I, uh, 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 that's Dominic there in the fifth mode of prayer. Uh, there's some really gorgeous ones along the, uh, uh, the connecting corridor, and this doesn't have the anachronistic moment. It's, 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 it's almost distinct because of that, 
but it's a genuine, marvelous work of art. This is the Noble May Tangeri, where Mary Magdalene uh, encounters the resurrected Jesus for the first time. Any human being encountered her. Uh, uh, this is uh, another Annunciation. <laughs> to my taste, it's actually more... All these are serene. These are frescoes that were on the monk's individual cell. I'll show you how it looked in a minute. Uh, but notice Peter Martyr standing in the background there. And he's in the fifth mode of prayer. Let me give you some idea of what that picture would look like in real life. There's a cell. This was a big cell for those days. I mean, it's not a big hotel room now. That was a big room. Uh, it was normal or ordinary in these convents, these religious convents, for a dormitory to be just that. Just that, only that. A dormitory, a place for sleeping. And you would have, you know, a long rows of beds and everybody would sleep more or less. And you had some kind of leadership or health problem, or leadership, health problem, I don't know why they connect those two. Uh, then you might have, uh, oh, I got to set back on. You, 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 you might have a, uh, like me. Uh, you might have a, a, a single uh, a room, but one of the innovations here at, uh, at uh, and it wasn't apparently an, an innovation, is that each monk, even the novices, had their own individual room. And there was a reason for that. They weren't interested in the guy's privacies, as you might think. Well, they might have been. But the reason for that is, is the room was not primarily for sleeping. It was for sleeping but it was primarily for studying. These rooms would have had a very simple bed, they obviously had a window, and they would have had a carol, a place to stand up and read, which were bigger then. And you would have a customer, you would be studying, not just one book, but you would have several books that you might be working at. So you would have a carol. And that's why it was not accidental that your library is on the same floor. This was part of the discipline of the, re, of the Reformed Dominican order. It, it sounds scandalous, excuse me, that preachers should know something, all right? But it's very important then, as part of the reform, that men who are going to preach and who are going to confess, uh, that men who are going to preach or have confessed, or confess, uh, have proper education. That was a general interest of the church after the uh, reforms, I shouldn't say reforms, but the, uh, the Fourth Lateran Council. But uh, the Dominicans took that on in a special. Maybe no one's ever been quite so serious of that since, certainly not before. And this uh, room, these rooms, not only these rooms, the entire complex of the San Marco con uh, convent is ordered toward those kinds of activities with that outcome of having effective, uh, faith-filled preachers. Okay, let's just go down the hallway with some of these splendid paintings. And by the way, can you imagine living for two years with that on your wall? How wonderful. The, the attachment you might have not only to the mystery, but the modeling of uh, Peter Martyr there. Uh, this, is a, this is not a good, uh, this is, must be a very old photograph because they've been restored and they're gorgeous and marvelous. The only trouble is you can't get as close to them as you used to be. In the old days, I was there. I am old. Uh, used to be, no one went to San Marco. They still don't go, not too many people go to it, but you used to be able to go in there and the rooms were open. Nobody was, you just go in the room. If you wanted to touch it, you could touch it. You wanted to sit down there on the floor and have chairs for you. But you want to sit there and stay there for an hour, a half an hour, you can do that. Now you can just poke your feet a little bit in the doorway and there's a big rope there and there's probably some kind of a buzzer if you get uh, your toenails underneath the rope. But, uh, and it's right that they do it. It's a beautifully curated, it's, it does, it's not owned by the Dominicans anymore, it's owned by the city of Florence. And uh, I have to say that it's a marvelously curated museum. Uh, look at that gorgeous coronation. Okay. And again, you have Christ and uh, Mary, but you also have, uh, have uh, from left to right, top of, uh, you have, um, you have uh, uh, 
I guess that would be Thomas Aquinas. You have, I believe that would be Benedict. You have uh, Dominic. You have St. Francis. That silly competition between the Franciscans and the Dominicans, it didn't exist among the Reformed. There was mutual respect there between the two. Uh, Dominic was, uh, was most, uh, uh, most beholding to some of his major ideas that he had gotten from Francis. And so they have a mutual respect for one another, and that carried over, at least in the early days of the two orders. And then you have Peter Martyr, and up to the right, I honestly don't know who that is, but I'm going to guess it's probably St. Mark, but I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I told you at the intersection of the clerics corridor and the novices corridor, you have the novice master. Look at this. Uh, see if I can go forward and back. He had two rooms. In one room he has this, and in the other room he has this. This is the novice master, 18 to 20 years old. Right? Not him, but the guys he's working with. What's the significance of this? Who's this guy? Come on. Who's this guy? Simeon, right? And who are these pokes? Jesus and Mary. And who's this guy? Jesus, what's going on here? According to Jewish law, they're presenting their son. It's a kind of oblation to the church. Or to the church, but to God. Right? You're firstborn. Right? And you have probably Anna, who is Simeon's cohort. Uh, a kind of a prophetess, I guess. I don't know what to make of Anna, to be honest. And then you have... Uh, uh, she's part of the picture. She's part of the event. He's outside the event. And by the way, it's very skillful on, on uh, as, as for artistry. It's very skillful on um, on uh, Frangelico's part to block out the interloper in a different space. I mean, what you got is a flat wall, right? And he's got different spaces there. You might say he's got the historical space and then the anachronistic space. All right? You got the real time Dominican model. Uh, well, actually, the real-time guy's out here, but you got the old-time Dominican model, and then you've got the historical event. But w what's the significance of this in a cell devoted to the life of the novice master? Who's he responsible for? He's receiving, sons. He's receiving the people's sons so that they might become preachers of the uh, yeah, the, the, the church preachers of the the word exactly right uh, just as important is the next room that he has he probably slept in the one and he worked in the other or had an entertainment had, had businesses or maybe confessions in there but you have uh, the enthronement of the child Jesus on Mary's uh, lap I guess we could say and this is St. Augustine, and can you even guess what book he would be holding or what document he would be holding? Don't say the Confessions. Don't say the City of God. Don't say De Trinitate, and since you don't know any of the other ones, what's it got to be? No. Summa didn't exist then. What's this, what is the novice master doing? He's teaching young men to be preachers, but he's also teaching them to be preachers in what order? Franciscans? Jesuits? Dominicans. What is the rule of the Dominican order? Who wrote it? Augustine wrote it. So he's holding the rule. But the rule needs to be interpreted by the constitutions, and that's Dominic. So the, 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 the documentary foundations of the order, of their work, of their lives, is depicted here as a very solemn obligation, you have to say, that would be falling upon the novice uh, master. 
uh, you know, you can neglect whatever you want to neglect. You can refuse to hear whatever you want to, don't want to hear. You can refuse to see what you don't want to see. But if you want to see in here, it was there to understand. And you didn't have to read a word. You had to know the stories. Uh, but it, it's through the power of artistry. And, uh, and that artistry is situated in properly designed uh, 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 dormitory. And uh, let's just go, uh, we're at the end. How, how could that happen so fast? Right? So anyway, we are at the end of this talk. And this talk was an attempt to uh, walk, take a walk through a building, not in Rome, but in Florence. And the title, I think, is helpful. It's a conspiracy of art and architecture. We could also say of art and architecture, politics, because Cosimo was not only wealthy, but he was a politically very active individual. He was concerned for Florence's well-being, and therefore the presence of the Dominicans there, as he was for his own family's well-being. So you have politics, you obviously have religion, you have art and architecture, and it all conspires in this marvelous building. And the only other thing that's absolutely marvelous is that it's there for you to see. After 600 years. Now that is a near miracle. Not too many of them. San Rocco in Florence the Scrivani Chapel in, um, in Padua, and some of the rooms in the Vatican uh, have that whole integrity of a program in which the, the tattooed room is talking to you. All right? But it's not talking to you, it's also working. It's part of the performance with people in them of a very spe specific, particular work. Hmm? And I don't know if art and architecture can do that anymore. Architecture might can. I'm not sure art can do that anymore. Uh, it's just hard to know what art can do these days. We think it can't do that. So what do we do? We just go back and repeat the old stuff and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? Why? Because it's old or has pious feelings attached to it. That wasn't what John Paul II acted. He didn't, he didn't say, go back to the past and do what they did. He said, don't do all that neo-Gothic stuff. Don't do that Renaissance stuff. Somebody's done that. Do what speaks to our age, if there's anything that speaks to our age. And I hope there's some artists in here who will figure that one out for us. Do you have any questions on this business? It's a, it, it's a, you don't see much of this in America. Right? Form of life, serious business, supported by the art and architecture and tremendous wealth. All that, all that was, was, was accomplished as a building project in a matter of about six years. Pretty amazing. And then the work that it accomplished as a result of that, who knows how to measure those things. Any questions about what we saw today? I'm not an art historian, right? I don't understand architecture and its technical aspect of it. I'm not a historian of the of the um, of um, of the Dominicans, but you don't have to be these things. There are resources. You pull those together, and you see that uh, that they're not just pretty pictures. They're pictures that work and talk. If you're willing to do that kind of work to where you can hear and see it. If you do that, your walk through Rome, Venice, Florence, marvelous, unforgettable, inspiring. Right? Well, uh, I think you're liberated, aren't they? You are liberated. <laughs>